Okay, here we go. We are on chapter 10. So we are moving along. Um, we are in week three. As a reminder, um, I just want to go ahead and give you this uh, this um, update, or I shouldn't say update, but go ahead and prepare you for next week. That will prepare you for week five. So I, I went ahead and um, made some adjustments and put some things together in uh, in week four, but the information that I put in week four it is actually for week five. But it doesn't hurt in your knowing a little bit more um, in advance. So I like to live by that motto of as soon as I know. Let me. I want to let you know. So I am preparing a group project for you all. You will see in week four the group members that are listed together. So you may want to, as soon as week four opens on Sunday night at midnight, you may want to look at that to see who your group members are so that you can go ahead and make contact and work on your group project. I don't want to give you all the details of it. I don't want to give you too much because I am going to give that information to you in the first video that I do for week four. But I just wanted to prepare your mind that you will have a group project coming up. And I am going to set up virtual office hours of where you can ask me any questions, of where you can um, ask for clarifying information. So I'll make myself available throughout next week to take your questions and comments and concerns so that you can have the project finished by week five. So um, I just wanted to kind of give you that information just so that you could have, um, just kind of prepare you mentally and, and um, academically, if you will, uh, for that announcement that will come next week and what you will see. I'm in this same um, moment of, of information and announcements. Um, you will have a test for week three, the week that we're in. I'm not sure if I said that in the first video, but you will have a test this week. You will not have a test for week four. So I want you to work on your project. You will not have a test for week five because I'm going to receive your project. The next time you will have a test will be week six, possibly week seven, and then your final week, um, week eight. So I'm trying to see how I want to give you the uh, the other two tests. I only want four tests for for the course. So definitely week three, possibly um, week seven. Um, so week six and seven will kind of be my weeks that I'll play with. Definitely week eight. So I, I'm, I want to kind of see those last three weeks of how I want to shuffle things out depending upon maybe what I sense um, about your workload or maybe what I sense about the time of the year. What is play by ear, but you can look forward to weeks six, seven, eight being your last times of testing. Out of those three weeks, two of those weeks will have to be a test. And I'm not really sure if I want to give you a test as a final, but again, I'll play with it. It's kind of how I sense things of what I want to do, but those last three weeks will be those weeks of, of testing. So I just wanted to tell you that to give you a little bit of a break mentally that this is the last um, test that you'll have for a while because I, I won't give you one for week four and I won't give you one for week five. You'll have enough to do, trust me. So those two weeks are kind of your breather to focus on your group projects and then look forward to weeks six, seven, and eight as another um, opportunity uh, for testing. So with that being said, I am going to dive right into chapter 10. Chapter 10. So we're still talking about early childhood. Um, we've gone through the biological. We've gone through the, um, the cognitive. You know, it's always the same three themes for all the chapters. So for each span of life, you will have biological aspects, you will have the cognitive aspects, and then you have the psychosocial aspects. So we're rounding up this, this trinity, if you will. We're, ri we're rounding up this uh, triple uh, aspect of um, early childhood. So we are in chapter 10. 
psychosocial development. So the first thing that we are talking about is that ability of emotional regulation. Um, the children, individuals are learning how to control when and how emotions are expressed. Again, this is school age. And so they're being taught, you don't do that. You don't throw temper tantrums, play nice, um, come and tell the teacher, uh, come and tell me as mom or dad. So th they're being taught um, how to control when and um, how emotions are expressed. Um, there is some brain uh, alignment that's happening there. The connections between the limbic system, and the prefrontal cortex, you know, that's beginning to develop and, and connect together and become more um, profound um, in the developmental growth of a child. And so we seem to think that there's, because of those connections, that you're able to regulate um, emotions a little bit better. Um, and again, this is between two and six. So this is where you'll see uh, children begin to say, I'm sorry for something that they've done that they were not supposed to do. Um, the temper tantrums and things are, are, are growing away. <laughs> they're growing away um they're just be they're beginning to understand how to control their body from every uh aspect and every level uh this is the stage also where um, parents and caretakers and teachers and other stakeholders in the lives of of the children this is where there's a profound impact of how we uh, handle, how we guide them through this developmental stage of their life. Because if you become too um, judgmental, if you become too corrective in your actions, if you become too critical in how they are behaving, then instead of forming initiative where they will make the mistakes and make the adjustments or um, see that they have an opportunity to make a mistake and they decide not to. If you become too involved in that growth process, they develop guilt. Guilt of, I didn't do this right, or I can't ever do anything right, or why did this happen, or how do I do this? It just becomes a part of, of their, their growing, um, and they don't handle failure well. And so when they get to a place where they didn't do well, well, because they're used to having that, that constant guiding, that consistent um, intervening on their behalf, they don't know how to handle um, disappointment. They don't know how to handle rejection. Uh, we saw a lot of that um, in, in, um, in education. And I, again, I speak from that perspective where children are uh, highly emotional when they when they don't do well. They're highly, highly emotional um, and they shut down. I mean, I have seen children where they didn't do something right and they completely, they just fall apart. And it's because they have been, you know, kind of regimented of, of how to do things. Um, uh, and they blame themselves. You know, I, I, I just I just can't do anything, you know, right in the shame. You know, they blame others. You just don't like me or I can't you know, do anything to please you. And it's something when you see it in children, but it also becomes apparent in adults. And so again, that initiative versus guilt, that level of, of development is very crucial to what you see in an adult. So you may have met adults where they cannot accept criticism, they fall apart. If, if you correct them on a job, they start crying. You know, there's nothing that you can really do. And, you know, and when you tell them that this is not right, you know, you may find an adult that'll say, you know, well, I can't ever do anything right. And, or they'll take the opposite and they'll blame you for it. Well, you should have told me what to do. And I mean, so I'm sure we have met people like that in our, our journey of life. And so this is an insight. It may not be the exact answer because we know that a lot of factors are, are influencing our makeup as an adult but this may be some insight into maybe a contributing factor of why the behavior that you see is being displayed. It, it, it stems back to childhood. And that's one thing that Sigmund Freud 
um, really honed in on. He said that a lot of things that we see, you know, in spite of all of his sexual in, uh, innuendos that he uses, <laughs> but the, the premise of his theory was that what you see as an adult stemmed from experiences as a child. And everyone that worked with Sigmund Freud kind of took that, that foundation and they put their own spin on it. They took out the sexual innuendos. They said, that's just weird. <laughs> and they put their own spin that would make sense across everyone that will read it. It was more for um, acceptability of their, of their theory. Um, Sigmund Freud, I'm not sure. I think he just went for the gusto and said, either you take it or not, but this is what I believe. And, um, and here it is. And everyone else is like, you know, well, that may be true, but let, let's color it a little bit differently so that it can be accepted and used uh, a little bit more um, popularly than, than what Sigmund Freud has said. So on the other end of the guilt and shame, um, the other end of it, when it's done the right way, so to speak, then you develop a sense of self-concept. You understand your um, who you are. You understand how to incorporate those beliefs about what you can do into your everyday functioning, your self-esteem. Um, it shows in your physical appearance. It shows in your personality. It may show as being bubbly and confident and, and friendly and, and nice and kind. All these different things are a product of self-concept. Um, and you're connected to parental confirmation. So although uh, you may um, you may receive the correction from parents, from teachers, from caretakers, there's a connection to it. There's a connection that let me apply it and oh, thank you for that. You know, I really appreciate you telling me that type of, of attitude. So it's the idea of self-concept um, that is, is exhibited uh, when it's done the right way, when it's emotionally developed in a positive direction. Uh, protective optimism. Um, Erickson says that young children are not realistic. They're very, they're very hopeful. And I think we appreciate that in children. They're very, very hopeful. They're very um, glass is half full. They're very, it's going to be okay. And, you know, we kind of lose that as we grow older. Uh, but children, that's one of the things that we love is that they always see the bright side of things and, and it's just it's just inherent, it's just in them. Um, and that gives them the confidence to persist. So that whole, and this is something for us as an adult that we can take right now as I'm speaking to you, this kind of came to mind that that optimistic approach to life, that optimistic way that children look at things contributes very uh, heavily on their resiliency. So you will find those, and you can attest to this, that those that are very, very resilient, maybe those adults, maybe you are an adult. Maybe you are a, an individual that, you know, you, whatever comes your way, you rise above it. Whatever is thrown at you, you're like, okay, I got it. We, we, we're going to take care of it. And if you really think about it, if you really think about why you're able to rise above those situations and circumstances, it is because you have a high sense of optimism, a protective optimism about that things are going to work out. So because you know that things are going to work out, then you're able to rise above whatever is coming your way. So that is just um, a little insert there, a little challenge to you that optimism um, is a main factor contributing to resiliency. And that's what children have uh, kind of monopolized at their age. It goes and it grows away, unfortunately. Um, but that's why children are so resilient because their optimism leads into their confidence and the confidence in themselves to persist through. So they become, they're strong, um, they're smart, attractive, and they're able to achieve their goals. When that diminishes, when they work in shame and guilt, that natural tendency for them to be strong, smart, attractive, and able to achieve their goals diminishes. And now they operate fully in shame and guilt. And there's, and unfortunately, again, that's how they will develop as an adult, unless something changes or someone influences them in a different direction. So this is just the neurological advances that are taking place in the ages of two and six 
You can read that at your leisure. Um, I do want to, again, point out the longer attention span. So now they're school age, they're ready. They're ready to sit in class. They're ready to sit in school. Um, and this is about four and five. They're ready to sit all day and go through their ABCs. They're ready to learn about math, you know, addition. And they're able to learn all these different things because their attention span has been um, uh, elevated to where they're able to hold information longer. They're able to receive information longer and retain it enough that their brain is able to process. Remember from intro to psychology, you know, we have to give our brains time to recognize when something is important. So our short-term memory has to be given time to be processed into long-term memory. So you know there's a window for short-term memory. If the information does not stay within the time frame of that window, then you forget it. And when you forget it, it doesn't matter if you've seen it, it doesn't matter that you've been exposed to it because it wasn't processed, then it's, it's not there. <laughs> it's just not there. So children are taught to, or at this age, you're able to retain information because their attention span is longer. And that being, that brings our deficit of ADHD of why it's so detrimental um, or debilitating to so many people because it deals with attention span. So it's not a disease. It's just that your attention span is so short that your short-term memory information received cannot be translated or processed into long-term memory. And so nothing gets done because you, you didn't remember because it didn't stick. And so you will find those that have such disorders as ADHD that they're taught skills that are naturally in us for whatever reason it didn't it didn't translate it didn't code well in some individuals so they have to they have to be taught to overcome that deficit and so i know i've heard adults that are saying you know i'm adhd i've seen children that are adhd and they kind of wear it as you know i'm not fixable like this can't be fixed and it's not true it's an attention deficit disorder so anything that's a deficit then you're able to teach to overcome what may be natural for one person. If you have ADHD, then you have to work harder in that area, but it's not impossible. It just takes more time. What's natural for someone has to be taught to someone with ADHD. And that person has to um, practice it over and over and over again in order for it to stick the one time that someone else would naturally go through it. So really ADHD and the overcoming of that deficit is all about determination and will and putting practical things into practice so that the attention can be worked together and can be manually, manually done. So the difference between someone with ADHD and someone without ADHD, if you look at our, uh, the differences in, in car systems, I don't know if anyone still has or remembers the the stick shift so the person without adhd is the cars that we have here it's automatic <laughs> you just put it in park you put it in drive you put it in you know reverse you just go you just put it in gear and you go but for the individual that had a that has adhd well you can't put your your system in 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 drive you're gonna have to manually manually move it around and so for some, it's very easy to get into the stick shift or get into the automatic car and, and kind of, you know, drive all over the place than it is to learn how to drive that car um, manually. And so that's what it just boils down to a little insert for you there. Um, and then again, you can read here some factors that uh, are related to emotional regulation or the maturity that will be family matters. Um, responsibilities in the house. I think I gave you some questions that will address this. Learning matters, what is being taught, the school system, the quality of education they are receiving, and culture. What is culturally sensitive to that child in the cultures that they are placed in. All of that deals with emotional regulation. You will find that there are some children that are, um, that are in, um, I don't want to say poverty, but are are reared in uh, less affluent 
families, that there are some struggles there financially, there may be some setbacks, there may not be enough money at certain times. Um, I remember I heard someone say, you know, I have more, I have more month than money. <laughs> so if you live in a household where sometimes you have your parents, maybe you have had more month than money, um, the children there are a little bit more uh, emotionally advanced, uh, meaning that they kind of see things from the perspective as an adult versus those that have the the really the um the freedom the liquidity of uh of money in the home where there's no questions or hesitation of what you can and cannot buy you just go out and get it uh the emotional regulation is different so when those children don't and can't get what they want they tend to fall apart but the ones that can't get they understand that there's a reason why and they just they just adjust so I know I see a lot of that, especially with Western and 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 other places of the world. Um, there's a different level of maturity. Eastern is a different level of maturity among the children, um, and it's not just culture. I think it also has to do with socioeconomic and those things of having to what they had to uh, had to work with and deal with. You'll find those that are here in American homes and. You know, every child has a has the latest phone, and when they don't have the phone, they you know they they fall to pieces. Whereas with the children that'll come over from other countries, they're like, we didn't have phones anyway, and they adjust <laughs> like they're okay. <laughs> um, the emotional regulation is different, and so I did want to bring in about the culture um, of that. Sometimes not having everything that you want develops you emotionally because you have to get over it. Whereas those that kind of get everything that they want you know they have a hard time regulating their emotions when things are not going according to plan and so again we look at the two types of uh, motivation we have intrinsic and extrinsic intrinsic is your personal drive so to connect your emotional regulation to motivation um you will find that those that are mature in their emotional regulation they have a higher sense of intrinsic motivation. Those are the ones that maybe, maybe they come from a broken home or maybe they come from family, a single parent home. Maybe they come from where they're divorced. Maybe they come from a family that was abusive or with alcohol or drugs, live in a bad environment. If they have a high sense of emotional regulation, then you find that they are very, very driven, very, very driven to do well. And it comes from the inside. You know, may, they may see this area as, you know, I want to do something more in little children. Two to six, you will see this in the need to feel smart. They become a little bit competitive. Um, they uh, have a, a different sense of humor. Um, they may even invent imaginary friends. Uh, sometimes they will find maybe one or two people that they will connect to, but they're very, they're the quiet, the quiet kids. Sometimes they're the quiet children. If they have a high sense of intrinsic motivation, they're very, um, they're very self-regulating. They're very, um, cognitive and, and, and cognitive, um, of, of what's going on. They, they understand these children sometimes are tagged or they're on their way into gifted and talented programs, their GT, um, which is of uh, the the other end, the I guess the positive end of special education programs. And if the parents don't recognize that, then because it's under, and I'm giving you some, some information, some insight here, if you don't ask for your child to be tested for gifted and talented, the educational system will not suggest it because it's under that um, that privacy, the highly sensitive area of special ed because of what was happening on the negative end. On the negative end of special education, if you saw a child that was not doing, performing the way that they should, then the teacher could recommend special education. Well, it was taken out of control because as we know, there was a lot of minority populations that were being recommended and they were being recommended, not because they didn't know, but because there were some other 
factors and challenges that were not being addressed. So for the teacher, the best way to get up to resolve the situation of the child not doing or maybe misbehaving because they didn't have the they didn't have the skill set was to recommend them into a special needs program, which they didn't really need. So because of that, the entire program suffered. Meaning that if you have a child that is really, really um, has a high sense of intrinsic motivation, um, really uh, smart and, and competent above their peers, the teacher still cannot recommend the child for gifted and talented because of what happened on the other end, the other end of the spectrum within that program. So if the parents for both, for the negative and for the positive, do not ask for it, then it will never be it will never be offered. So parents, if you have children that have a high sense of intrinsic motivation, it may be um, it may be beneficial for you to ask to get the child tested for gifted and talented um, because it just gives them it 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 develops and it fosters that intrinsic motivation that they have to keep going because of course life will throw challenges at you um things will happen and that fire inside of you to do well sometimes is doused with fire i mean doused with water of life or it grows it grows cold and so if a way to academically keep your children a suit it may be advantageous to you um to ask for the child to be tested, even if they don't do well, but just to ask, just to ask. And, but most times whenever you have a child that is, that is um, asked to be tested, uh, they usually are, are tagged as, I mean, that's usually just part of who they are. They're, they're gifted and talented. And that's what we label here in this country of gifted and talented children, because there's a high sense of intrinsic motivation that we want to tap into and cater academic curriculum that will keep encouraging that high sense of intrinsic motivation that they have. So the other end of it, or the another aspect of motivation is extrinsic motivation. That is um, the, the need to achieve rewards from the outside. So this is the type of motivation where there's accolades and accomplishments and achievements and you get the degree for this and you get the degree for that. Um, this is the ones, and I'm just going to use my profession and use my area as a, as a, as an example. This is the ones where, you know, sometimes you'll go out and you meet individuals and they're very, very proud to be called a doctor. Very, very, I mean, that was just an achievement and they have gone, we have gone through a lot to receive that degree. And it may have been very, very difficult. I remember I was, um, I spoke with someone and he, he was giving me some advice of how to write my dissertation. And um, and I said, yes, sir. He said, no, not sir, doctor. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. he said, no, not sir, doctor. I said, yes, doctor. <laughs> I thought that was just the funniest thing. That's the funniest thing. Um, but for whatever reason, that was a high sense of accomplishment and he wanted it recognized. And I just obliged because it's, it's, it's really okay. It's really okay. But extrinsic motivation is the drive to pursue a goal. Many of you are here in this class because of, the, uh, of an in extrinsic motivation. It, it may be intrinsically motivated for you to do well, but there's an extrinsic part of it as well of receiving your degree so that you can take care and achieve those things that you have set forth as goals in your life for you and your family. So it may start as intrinsic, but it may work later as extrinsic. And what you have, the height of your intrinsic, again, it can be affected by your extrinsic. You may have had a professor that was not willing, that was not, you know, likable, that wasn't, you know, teaching you very well. And that motivated you to drop the class. And for some people it was so devastating, they dropped out of school. And so we have to be careful because extrinsic motivation that attaches to another person's esteem, another person's uh, well wishes for you, another person's um, encouragement to you, when, especially when you're not doing well. So extrinsic is just as important as intrinsic. I was, um, I actually did my dissertation on extrinsic motivation between dissertation students and their, their chairpersons. And you would not believe the number of people 
that they'll get to there. They've gone through all these courses. There are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and they'll get to dissertation and they'll have, which is that long paper that have to be written and they'll get to a chairperson and the chairperson, which is like their, their, um, their advisor, their coach that will lead them through writing that paper and will correct it. Basically the chair is the person that will approve your having your doctoral degree because they have to recommend your paper for approval. So if they don't recommend it, then you won't ever get it. And so some people get to that point and they'll meet a professor that may have had a bad experience. So they wanna give you a bad experience to, to make sure that you pay your dues to get in. There may be some, some clashes there personality wise. They may just say that you don't write well enough according to their own expectations. They may give you a hard time of sending you back over and over. And the person that is receiving this information, the student is saying, God, I mean, I've written this paper like five times already and it's, it's not good enough. It's not good enough for you. It may not be good enough for the university, but it's not good enough for you. And I tried to, you know, um, get along with you and I really need your support. I really need your encouragement. And the professor is not giving them that encouragement or support or positive feedback. And ladies and gentlemen, the, the person that has paid all of this money that is right there at the end will say, you know what? I give up, I'm finished. And they will walk away, they will drop out of the program and they'll still have all of this money in debt that they have to pay back and no degree, no degree. There's no such thing as almost finished. You either finished or you didn't. So they paid all of this money with no degree. And what's heartbreaking is they will never go back. They'll just chalk it up to, hey, I tried and I didn't make it, I quit. They'll never, all because of one person. So extrinsic motivation is a real powerful factor in the goals in achievements set by you as a person. So we all need somebody. We all need somebody. As a child, <laughs> coming back, I don't know why I'm going to this area of, of you know, what it looks like as an adult, but you know, I, I hope it helps somebody. Um, but going back to children, cause we're in the children two to six. This is where they'll have imaginary friends. Um, and it's just a combat loan. Maybe they're the only child. And imaginary friends is not just kind of sitting there, you, you made up, you know, like on a, this little cartoon where uh, the, the child, you saw the emotion, disgust and anger and all of that. And, you know, and then uh, there was one part where the happy and sad were kind of trying to get back to the child because they were on their own journey and they met up with uh, the child's imaginary friend um, I think his name was, was Bing Bong. Excuse me, I watch a lot of children's movies with my children. <laughs> the big purple, fluffy, imaginary friend that the child had at that age. Um, th those things, that's not the only form of imaginary friends. You may find imaginary friends as children are playing with dolls or playing with trucks or playing with different things. You'll hear them talk and to have different roles. You may have them with their action figures and their, you know, Batman and, you know, so forth and so on. And they are able to say what Batman was saying. They're able to say what, you know, the villain would say. That's another example of imaginary friends. You may have the dollies and they're going to a party or <laughs> whatever. They're having a conversation. That would be another example of imaginary uh, friendship. And again, that is done to combat loneliness they may not have anyone to talk to. Um, they may be the youngest. They may be the only one, you know, what have you. And it also helps in emotional regulation because you'll see, I know with my with my children, I was, my girls, they would play dollies with each other and I would just kind of listen in. I thought it was so funny. They would, you know, get into an argument. The two dolls would get into an argument and, you know, um, and I'm sorry. And and maybe the, one of the dolls would just, you know, slap her in the face. <laughs> So I'm so grateful that was in, in play and it didn't really happen, but they learned that, you know, and, and even with that, you know, whenever she would slap her in the face, she would say, you know, they start crying and don't do that. And, you know, that was really hurtful. And I mean, they would just go through the whole 
shebang of emotions there. So when they got to real people, they were like, I know what Barbie went through. <laughs> I don't want to do that to you. <laughs> and so that leads into play. Um, play is good for children. Play is really, really good, but not just for parents where they find something to do, but play is really helpful and that it helps them to act out those social norms, helps them to act out things that are acceptable, um, gets out things that they really can't display, uh, that they have regulated for themselves. They want to let it all out with their toys. So play is good. Play is universal and it's timeless. So the more that children play, um, the more socially astute and astound um, they become when they interact with, with others. So as you can see with this bullet, that um, second bullet, that uh, social play is due to um, maturing coupled with many hours. So it works together. It, it just works together. Playmates um, are important as well. I know um, we're in a culture of play dates may not now because of COVID, but uh, we 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 believe in the um, the uh, the need for for playdates for playmates, and so in school systems, um, it's naturally the environment is conducive for that to happen in a more natural environment. Maybe for younger parents um, with younger children or parents with younger children um, that don't have them in daycare, maybe stay at home parents, the play dates um, are necessary so they can have the social interaction. Um, so it just it just allows for more interaction, more development of emotional regulation, of empathy, social understanding, um, how to interact with others, uh, how to feel compassion. And again, empathy, if someone's feelings are hurt, what do you do when you make someone cry? When you, what do you do when someone hits you? What do you do whenever you're hit? What do you do when you fall down? Um, how do you show compassion if someone fell off their bike? You know, all these different things. So playmates are good. Playmates are good. The types of social play, you have solitary, um, playing by themselves. You have onlooker, they're kind of looking at others, um, playing, uh, parallel play, um, Two children are playing with toys in the same area, but they're not playing together. So you see a lot of this in daycare. So they're they're both, you know, with their trucks. You know, one is you know zooming this way, another zooming the other way, but they're not zooming together. <laughs> Parallel play, associative play, um, that they're they're interacting, they're kind of sharing things, but they're still not playing together. It's more of um, parallel play, but they're acknowledging each other. So they're like, here, you know, you can have this or here, take, you know, you can take my, take my dolly. But it's, this is still, but this is still my set of blocks. You'll see this with, with, that are sharing blocks. So they may be playing blocks, that's a better example. They may be playing blocks with each other or playing blocks and maybe they're both building castles and I may need your pink or your yellow block to make my to make my castle higher, but we're not playing a castle building together. Like these are my blocks, these are your blocks. I'll give you one, but I still need these to build my own castle. So that's associative play. And then cooperative play, which is the most productive, is where you're playing together, you're creating together, you're elaborating together, you're joining, you're taking turns. So in school, we prefer cooperative play. In life, we prefer cooperative working together, which tells me or which um, is why I gave you a group project. I want you to work cooperatively, although it'll be a, um, your own individual submission, I still want you to work cooperatively. I, I don't want solitary, so I don't want anyone to tell me I can't work well with groups please try. I don't want onlookers. I don't have any onlookers. I don't want onlookers where you'll, you know, you look at what they're doing and you don't help. Um, I don't want parallel where, you know, you're working on your part and they're working on the other part. I don't want associative where you're sharing slides, but you're not really, I want cooperative. Please be cooperative. Even if you're sitting there together and you're talking, have some discourse, get to know your 
your classmates. You never know where you may see each other again. So work cooperatively, please. Don't work associatively or, or, or please not in solitary. Work together. Um, rough and tumble play. Rough and tumble play. Um, yeah, we see this a little bit, um, a little bit more in, in boys, unfortunately. We have some girls that are kind of, you know, that kind of like the rough and tumble play. Um, we see a lot of this with fathers and, and children, whether it is um, boy or girl. We see a lot with fathers and mothers are not very, they're more nurturing. So they're not doing a lot of rough and tumble. But fathers, I don't know what it is, a lot of rough and tumble play. Um, it's aggressive, but it doesn't mean to harm. Not trying to, you know, um, cause harm to the baby when you, when you throw them up in the air. It's just just rough and tumble. Um, you kind of, you know, you may see this in different cultures expressed differently. It may be a little bit of boxing and jabbing here, but it's not, 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 no harm. It may be a little bit of sparring here. It's no harm. Maybe playing football here and some tumbling. It's no harm. It's just a rough and tumble play. Um, and this is where you hear, you know, we're just playing. You know, you run in, you're like, what's going on? No, 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 we're just playing. Um, girls tend to do that as well. Um, a little bit of that. Um, and sometimes girls will prefer if they, if they crave that rough and tumble play, you will find that some girls will hang or will start to uh, grow closer to boys, not because of any type of um, sexual orientation. They just like rough and tumble play. <laughs> And so you will find that some girls are kind of, you know, hang out with the guys because it's kind of, you know, a, a rough housing type thing. They just like the rough and tumble play. Um, unfortunately, when you see that happening, then there's there's shame, there is um, taunting, there is bullying, and you will find that some girls that just like rough and tumble play. They have been shamed and 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 bullied about it that they'll begin to identify that if I am not accepted as a girl, just liking rough and tumble play, and if this is what I'm going to go through, then I really like rough and tumble play. So maybe I should identify with boys because they allow me to have rough and tumble play. They don't give me a hard time. So you'll find something that will say, you know, forget the, the girls. I like doing this. I like playing football. I like doing this. And they'll begin to identify with that gender just because of commonalities of preferences that they have for this type of active play. So we have to be careful in how we, um, we uh, criticize the type of play that children prefer. Um, drama and pretending. Um, we know what this is. This is a lot of um, rehearsal and, and social rules, you know, princess and cops and robbers and, you know, things like that. So this is a dramatic play, um, our socio dramatic play. So it's done in a social setting. Um, there is a uh, uh, another cartoon that I watch with my watched with my children and um, I'm not sure if it was Boss Baby or something with the, something with the baby, Storks. That's what it was, Storks. And there was a part there where the, the little boy, he was, um, he was on an intergalactic mission and he was going through the whole set, even to the point where, you know, he was surrounded by aliens and, uh, and what happened there. And it was because he was trying to play with his father, but his father was very, father and mother were very work driven and they really didn't have time. And so that was him. Um, he was the only child. And so he was developing this whole, you know, social dramatic scene to take care of his loneliness of being the only child. He even asked to the point of the movie, you know, could he have um, a brother? And they laughed it off and they laughed at it. And the whole movie's about um, storks delivering babies that had stopped delivering babies because of his request. And then through a, a other series of, uh, of silly and, and funny events, he finally got the, the ninja playing sibling that he desired. So it's a really pretty funny movie. Check it out if you want to. But that gives you a good example of socio-dramatic play 
that enables a child to explore and rehearse social rules, learn to explain ideas and persuade uh, playmates, practice emotional regulation, and develop self-concept in a non-threatening way. Screen time. Um, screen time takes away from that active play that children need. Uh, screen time um, moves a child more into self-isolation and away from self-esteem and control uh, emotional regulation. So those two things are taken away when they're sitting in front of a screen. So many use um, screens, TV, tablets, iPads, iPhones, um, cell phones, you, you know, you name it, um, three or more hours a day. And we're like three hours on, like, yeah, they use it for three or more hours a day. Um, does it, is this one, one show after another? You know, you can start them in the morning at nine and then you may not start moving around until noon. That's three hours. <laughs> it's morning hours, but it's, just, it's still three hours. Um, and the consequences, as we noted here, um, at least the immaturity, because they don't know how to interact with others. There's no social development. There's no, there's no social, emotional um, regulation. And so all they're seeing is these people, you know, shooting at each other or singing the bing bong song or <laughs> when they get to real people, there's no gun involved. Um, they don't behave like that if they get mad because you're not supposed to. You can't beat someone up if you get upset. And there's no bing bongs that people are singing whenever they're happy. <laughs> and so you're considered weird because you don't know how to interact with others. And there's little intellectual growth. Emotional um, control, remember, it's it's growing those, those synapses in the prefrontal cortex. So if you're not learning, if you're not having to use emotional regulation in your day-to-day -day interactions, then those synapses are not growing. Um, and then challenges for caregivers. Um, the things that we have to incorporate into, into a child is expressions of uh, warmth, strategies for discipline, expectations for maturity and communication. Those are the four dimensions that we have to operate in as caregivers to develop an emotionally sound child that will now move into being an emotionally sound adult. Types of parenting styles, you have authoritarian. This is a little bit of a recursor from Intro to Psychology. Authoritarian, um, very strict punishment. The discipline is almost kind of a military, little communication. You do what I say, um, no questions, it's my way or the highway um, type thing. Uh, high behavioral standards, authoritarian. Um, permissive, um, very nurturing very nurturing, um, but little discipline, um, little guidance, little control, but very high in nurturing and communication. Well, we don't do this. Well, that's not what you're supposed to do. Um, let's act in a nice way. Let's do this in a, in a good way. Um, I'm going to help you through it. Nothing wrong. It's a more as a lot of nurturing, very high nurturing, very high community, a lot of talking, but there's not if you do it again, this is what's gonna, there's no consequences. It's just, let me talk to you again. Well, if this happens, let me talk to you again. If this happens, let me talk to you again. <laughs> it's okay, you, you'll grow out of it. Um, but no, no, a little discipline, um, no guidance of how to do things better. And so there's no control. And it can be a little bit um, exasperating if this is your parenting style, especially when the child needs guidance because they haven't they're not learning especially if you have this type of parenting style and they're isolated and they're with the video games and with their in front of the tv so now they're not learning how to behave from other people and the parents are not teaching them how to behave with other people so when they get around other people they are just all over the place and then finally we have authoritative parenting where there's limits and there's rules, but there's some flexibility and they're listening. A lot of parents prefer in Western culture to be more authoritative. 
They don't want to be, it's like two ends of the spectrum. You have authoritarian, it's like military. You have permissive, like um, Disney World. <laughs> and then you have authoritative, which is like, uh, I don't know, some, uh, some state fair, I guess. It won't last forever. <laughs> it's not always there. It comes around every once in a while and it's flexible. You can move the dates, but the other two extremes is, is absolute, absolute. Um, and then the fourth style that um, leads to um, CPS getting involved, that leads to uh, abuse, is neglectful and uninvolved parenting. Um, kind of indifferent, kind of whatever they want to do, um, just not involved. So here are some long-term effects of this type of parenting. I think it's very interesting to note, and you can read more about it if you if you desire. Children of authoritarian um, parents, as the military, very conscientious, um, very obedient, quiet but not really happy, um, may feel guilty or depressed and blame others, or blame themselves rather, blame themselves when things don't go well. Um, so that would they were either become rebels. Um, and leave home and kind of figure it out, or they'll uh, they'll have to grow grow out of it through some different interactions. Children are permissive, um, unhappy, and lack self control because they're looking for guidance. I was I read an article maybe about ten years ago um, dealing with with teachers, and it's, it was an article that was really interesting. Is that children? They uh, they talk about the mean teachers, the mean teachers, but they really like them because <laughs> they they give them structure. They they teach them how to control themselves, and they have high expectations. They won't tolerate you know their their lack of self control. They they secretly like them, <laughs> but they're mean to you know they're mean, but they really like them. And I found myself I, when I found that article kind of gave me permission to be that type of teacher without feeling guilty. So, and I found that over and over again, I have had children when I taught them that there are some that's like, you know, Miss King is, you know, really, really, you know, mean and I can't stand Miss King while we were going on. But it's like at the end of the school year, they were like, you know, Miss King, I was like, love, <laughs> who are you? <laughs> and I remember one school that I taught at um, and those children were horrible. <laughs> they were horrible. But I left the school in the middle of the year to move to Texas, matter of fact, and the children, not the parents, because the parents, well, they didn't like my, like me either because I was giving the children too much work. I gave them too much work. They, they didn't like it. And the children complained about Miss King. They didn't like it. But the children on their own accord organized a going away party for me. And they got their parents involved and they got the school involved. And that was a complete, I didn't know about it, complete surprise. They got the whole, the most horrible class. The They organized a school going away party for me. I was like, wow, wow. So they really desire control and direction. And they want it from those that have been placed in their lives to take care of them. They suffer from inadequate emotional regulation. They're immature. They lack friendships. Um, they continue to live at home, still dependent because they they just don't know what to do. And authoritative, which is the goal of many Western cultures, um, the children the become successful, articulate, happy with themselves, generous with others, well liked by teachers and peers. Um, especially when their individual uh, initiative is valued. So they're the, they're the go-getters. They're the ones that do well. They're the ones that, you know, teachers tend to prefer. Um, they become the, the light of the family, so to speak. So that's some information here. Um, and then we know that uh, how you raise children adds to um, how they become as an adult and some information about physical punishment. Um, it increases obedience, um, but it also increases the possibility of later aggression. They get upset, they get angry, and they learn to avoid punishment, so, but they'll still continue in the, the behavior that they shouldn't do. 
So it's, it's advised that you may not do a lot of physical punishment and do a lot more of redirection. So corporal punishment, um, again, the same thing. They become angry. They don't become violent adults. Um, they don't become violent adults. So I think that's why many parents hold on to the spanking because we're like, you know, we were spanked and we're okay. <laughs> um, but it does, uh, it does give signal to some other influences, some other influences. Now they're saying poverty and temperament. I'm not sure about that, but what I am sure about is that if you were spanked as a, as a child and you're okay as an adult, um, that tends to be your go-to of how you raise your own children. And you know that you're not, that you still have some, some areas that you wish that you would have been talked to and listened to and not spanked. So that is a tendency in you that now you're passing on to your children. So although you didn't need all those spankings, you tend to give that same amount of spankings to your children. So that's really not a, not the best thing. Unless you're willing to do some things differently and not spank as much, but give to your children that you want it to have been given to you. When you have that mindset, then you can overlook all those spankings that you got with those wooden spoons and belts and things of that nature. You cannot do as much with your own. So you were spanked, true, and you're okay, and you're not gonna go out and, and, and hurt anybody, but then you're not giving your children the same chances that you would have liked to have been given as a child. So you're feeding into a negative cycle. So alternatives to spanking, which I think most of us are doing is a, a psychological control. Um, maybe you will withdraw support or maybe you'll withdraw um, love that will allow <clears throat> the child to feel guilty that they, they hurt your feelings, <clears throat> they disappointed you, and then they'll adjust their behavior. Remember, they're able to. They're able to adjust their behavior. <clears throat> they have emotional regulation and then it'll turn to gratitude. Um, when you employ these type of methods, then you have more, you have higher control. Higher control. Um, you have higher control. Timeouts, some information here about timeouts. Um, the object is to separate them from you, separate them from, gives the child a chance to, uh, to think about emotionally, remember it's emotional regulation. So when they're in timeout, the object is for them to emotionally regulate themselves. Think about what they've done, um, calm down their behavior, give you a chance to relax, <laughs> and then you come back together and you can talk some things out. <clears throat> Will all of those different alternatives give you the perfect child? Absolutely not. <laughs> but as with anybody, it's it's an investment. And you just work the investment well, you adjust where necessary, and then you allow whatever is going to happen to take place um, and see what happens. So some information about the biological uh, orientation um, of, of children. Um, there's one thing of being born into a into a sex or gender and then identifying with a sex or a gender. <clears throat> and so um, we help with that identifying as well. They're born in one gender, but they have to um, be guided to identify with that gender. And again, as I told you before, some children um, they just identify with a different gender based on the different things that they like. And, and you know, we have our roles that we play in that. <clears throat> um, we're going to kind of move through some things. Here's uh, Sigmund Freud and, and what he's talking about. I'll leave that for you a lot in this chapter. So I'm sorry. I'm so sorry about the, the length of the, the video. Um, 
gender differences behave what's appropriate for each gender I'm gonna you know read that at your leisure cognitive theories gender schema what's how should a boy behave how should a girl behave you know that information there socio cultural theory um, the values that you should have as a boy or as a girl all of that is there evolutionary um, going from identifying with one and then be attracted to another gender as you're going through, again, which theory is best, it's more of a hodgepodge of all of them intricately um, taught, intricately uh, weaved into the, the being of a person. Um, teaching right or wrong, right and wrong. Um, all these different theories. I don't want to go into it. Please read it at your leisure. I gave you a lot of information for you to, uh, to look at and, and work on moral development. You know, we teach things like that. And that brings us to an end. I'm so sorry for the length of the video. I really enjoyed. I love um, all theories of, of cognitive development. Um, I, I love uh, anything that allows you, um, anything that allows you to learn more of, of who you are. And so um, I'm sorry, I got kind of carried away with it. I, I love how we learn things. It just makes tolerating each other so much better because you understand where we're all coming from. Um, if there is nothing more, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you want to get some insight, you want to give a little bit of revelation that you have received from this, as always, leave them in the thread below.